Oh, 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 my head. God, how much did I drink? Well, I didn't trash the place, at least. Everything seems to be as it was, so, you know, that's a plus. What's this? Dear Master War, whilst you were sleeping, I took the liberty of securing a copy of your next game to review. Hmm. Well done, Winston. I also have gathered all the equipment necessary to complete your task. Kind regards, Winston. Kiss, kiss. Jesus, how long was I actually out for? That's kind of embarrassing. Well, you heard the man. I've got a new game to review and a task to complete, so I best get started on doing that and capturing footage for this thing before I end up passing out and waking up in some fucking kid's birthday party or something. So excuse me, I'm just gonna take a moment to do this. It's uh, not gonna take me a long time to do it all. I, I, I really believe it this time. Development for the fourth Tomb Raider game began in 1998, not long after the release of Tomb Raider 3, which was yet another critical success for the studio, selling over 6 million copies worldwide as of 2009. However, while many praised the game for combining the best elements from both previous games together, others were more critical of it by pointing out that, even though the series had improved itself with each new installment, it's not really done a whole lot to evolve the core formula it created back in 1996. So with that in mind, Core Design began working on the next Tomb Raider, which was to be built on a brand new game engine that would not only allow them more creative freedom, but would also allow for more advanced level design, more detailed graphics and better porting to PCs. The result was Tomb Raider The Last Revelation, a game that was released for PlayStation 1, PC and for the first time ever on the Sega Dreamcast. This was definitely a different beast than its forebearers, as it ditches the usual globetrotting in favour of just one location this time, and focuses a lot more on its storytelling than it had done in previous games. I'm well aware that a lot of fans here hold this game in quite high regard, and some even go as far as to say it's their favourite of the classic series. And whilst Tomb Raider The Last Revelation does a lot of things that make it superior to the last three games, it also does a fair few things that keep it from outshining them as well. That's not me saying this game sucks and isn't worth your time because this couldn't be further from the truth. There are many ways this game is better than its predecessors and fixes a lot of the problems that they had. For example, one major complaint that people had with Tomb Raider 3 that I completely forgot to mention in my last video is that each item that you collected didn't show up on screen like in previous titles. Thankfully, this has all been fixed, as not only do all items that you collect show up on screen in a larger size, but they're also full 3D objects that rotate instead of just static 2D sprites. Lara has had an upgrade in her polygon count, which removes the gaps in between her joints and gives her a more smooth and natural shape to her instead of the more angular and blocky form that she'd had in previous games. Unfortunately, Lara's moveset remains largely untouched from before, except for the ability to now climb poles, swim sideways with the shoulder buttons, and the inclusion of a new rope swinging mechanic. But before I get ahead of myself, let's take a look at this game from the beginning and see how it plays out. At first everything is like it was before, you boot up the game and get the usual core design and IDOS company logos, but it's not long after that that things start to become unfamiliar. Immediately the first thing you'll notice is that the ring shaped menu system from previous games has been replaced with a static text based menu system. It's certainly a more functional looking option than before, but it lacks the charm and personality of the original menu system. It's like they changed it seemingly for the sake of doing things differently, and I don't really feel like the payoff was worth it here. The second thing you're likely to also notice is the floaty weird camera work that's going on in the background. This video sequence replaces the static background images found in the original menu screens and serves as a showcase of sorts for the setting this game takes place in as well as giving off a more cinematic feel to the whole thing. The third and final thing that you may notice is the lack of a Croft Manor tutorial level, something that has been a staple of the series since the first game and was a fun little extra level for players to mess around in. Instead, when you start a new game, the first level acts not only as an introduction to the game's narrative but also as one big tutorial in disguise. Here you take control of a teenage version of Lara Croft on an adventure with her Austrian mentor, Werner von Croy, through the ruins of Angkor. What? What the fuck was that? During this level, the player is taught how to play the game by having von Croy explain to Lara how to perform each action and then follow it up with a demonstration. The first obstacle, a small hop to test your, how do you say, 
pluck. Press and hold walk. Now push forward. No. It's a simple enough framing device to ease new players into the game's world without taking them too much out of the experience. However, there's just one problem. This section cannot be skipped. At all. One of the main benefits of having Croft Manor as an optional tutorial was that returning players who were already familiar with the game's controls could choose to bypass it completely and jump right into the action should they wish. Here the developers seem to have gone in the opposite direction by making the game's tutorial mandatory. That way, new players have a chance to get familiar with how the game works and are ready before their adventure really begins. This only really is of benefit to first-time players, while returning players are almost punished for wanting to replay the game by being forced to take part in something that they no longer need to. Had the game included an option to let you skip cutscenes and move at your own pace, this likely would have alleviated the issue, but instead you're frequently forced to stop and sit there and wait until the cutscene finishes before you can continue, further exacerbating the problem. There were several moments in this level where I'd walk into another room and know exactly what I needed to do, but just as I would go to do it, the game would stop me in my tracks so that Von Croy could explain to me how to do the thing I was literally about to do. In fact, it was so dedicated to its own rules, it stopped me whilst I was in mid-jump so it could tell me that I needed to jump. You know, it's not like I've been doing these things for free fucking games by now and know exactly what I need to do, but hey-ho. You will catch your death in those clothes, my dear. Well, that definitely wasn't creepy in every conceivable way. After completing a few more basic tasks, you're then asked to crawl through a vent to open a door. Inside the room with the switch, you stumble upon a skeleton holding a familiar looking backpack, which Lara immediately decides to take for herself. And that ticks off the origin story of Lara's backpack off the list of things I really didn't need to have explained. The next room teaches you how to use the new rope swinging mechanic, which is functional if kind of fiddly, and afterwards you slide down a hole and into the next area. In this section, you're pitted against Von Croy in a race to the chamber of something called the Iris, which acts as a small end of level test to see how much the player has learnt and also to see how well they'll act under pressure. Aside from a couple of pits and high ledges to fall off of, there's no real stakes involved here. So if you don't end up winning the race, the only thing you'll end up missing out on is a cutscene with some different dialogue and perhaps some good old fashioned bragging rights for what they're worth. However, the inclusion of a timer in this section is a little puzzling. On the one hand, it serves to motivate the player to try and race to the end as quickly as possible, but on the other hand, it's completely pointless if you really stop to think about it. This seems to be a simple carryover from the Assault course of Croft Manor, but the big difference here is that unlike the Assault course that can be replayed from the beginning at any time if you fail, once you reach the end of this section here, you can't go back to try again. If you wanted to go back to replay it to get a better time, for whatever reason, then you would have had to have remembered to have made a save beforehand in order to do so. Had this game been released in a more modern time, this easily could have been something that would have been relegated to a bronze level trophy or a 5G achievement on Xbox or something. But the lack of any in-game reward for doing good at this means that only the die-hard of fans would have actually bothered to try and do this, and for the rest of us there's no real incentive to want to try. Once you're in the chamber, Lara reads a tablet that warns not to remove the iris or face dire consequences, but Von Croy dismisses this all as hocus pocus, even though they're literally in a room with a giant spinning globe slash chocolate orange, and declares, I am the great Von Croy, and takes the iris from its pedestal anyway. With the chamber beginning to collapse around them, Lara has no choice but to ditch the old man who is now trapped inside the giant chocolate orange and escape the chamber before they're both trapped inside for good. Now, presumably after Lara had made it to safety, she then went to Daddy Dearest to use their vast amounts of wealth and resources to mount a rescue mission to save him. Right? I mean, it's not like they would just presume that he had died in there and decided to just leave him to rot while she then buggered off to have a successful Tomb Raiding career. Right? Nope. Instead, we immediately flash forward to the present day, where we see Lara taking a trip into the Egyptian desert. Ah, I see. So uh, that's exactly what happened then. Whilst looking for the entrance to a tomb, she has a run-in with an army of scorpions and eventually runs across a lever in the ground that causes the floor to collapse beneath her. She falls down a sandslide and then ends up in the first proper level of the game. 
Right away you'll notice that the game's cinematic quality has increased a lot since the last game. Not only are cutscenes more elaborate than before, but the in-game camera is used in the same way as a movie camera to set the scene and highlight important areas in the level. Often you'll enter a large room with multiple doorways or points of interest and the camera will swoop and pan around the environment to show you everything that you need to see. I really like that they did this as it takes away one of the most frustrating elements from earlier Tomb Raider games where you spent a lot of time just aimlessly kind of wandering around, wondering where to go and what to do next. Although it's not quite perfect, and there is still quite a bit of that in this game, which we'll get to later. At the beginning, you start in a cavern with only one direction to travel in, but there are several opportunities to deviate from this path that reward the player for exploration. Not long afterwards, you're introduced to your first puzzle, where you have to poke your hand through some holes in the wall to find a switch. Once the switch has been found, you then see the room below you begin to fill with sand, which then allows you to cross over to collect the first item you need to open the door to the next chamber. It's a pretty insignificant puzzle, but it lets you know that there will be new elements at play here that will allow you to solve future puzzles in more interesting ways. Later on, there's even a puzzle that requires your guide to set fire to the water in the room below, and then you have to jump between each panel it lights up in the room above it to then open the door ahead of you. You also have rooms full of your usual spike traps, spinning blades, and lava pits, but they all feel brand new again because of the way that they've been implemented. Spikes, for example, can now shoot out from any surface to surprise you, instead of being static objects that sit on the floor or at the bottom of pits waiting for the player to fall on them. Though I'm not too sure about the effect the developers used to achieve this, they kind of stretch out and bounce around like they're made of jelly or something, which is kind of weird. It makes them look less of a threat and more like something you'd see at a fairground haunted house. With a new game comes a new batch of weapons for you to play with, and this game ups the ante further by also throwing different ammo types into the mix. Not only do you have the standard favourites like the shotgun, Uzis, Magnum and grenade launcher, but you can now pick up a crossbow as well. The shotgun has normal and wide shot ammo, and no, I don't have any idea what the benefit of wide shot ammo is, so don't even ask. The grenade launcher has three ammo types, which are normal, super, which is I guess like normal but bigger, and flash, which I never found a use for ever and felt was kind Kind of a waste. And lastly, the crossbow, which has normal ammo, poison ammo, which kills a living target in under 20 seconds, and explosive ammo, which makes everything go kablam. One thing that did surprise me is the extremely early introduction of the shotgun, which can be casually found in a small pit just a few feet from where you start here. In fact, there are several times in this game where you can pick up a brand new shotgun even if you have one already equipped, which is in stark contrast to before, where extra weapons were either found in secret areas or part of one level. It's nice to know that they want to make sure that we're all prepared, but I can't help but feel that this takes away some of the joy of finding a new weapon in this game. Like, instead of searching high and low and being rewarded by finding something new, you're kind of just given it, and it's just not the same. Thankfully, if you do go for the secrets in this game, you're often rewarded with some really good stuff. As a matter of fact, in the first level, you can swing from this rope here to another ledge to access a totally different area of the level that rewards you with early access to the Uzis, a weapon that you don't come across naturally until much later in the game. You may have noticed that during the gameplay that I've shown here that Lara is looking a little more... ample, shall we say? Well, after three videos, I can't put off talking about it anymore, so let's talk about Lara's, uh, um proportions. It's no secret that the original design of Lara Croft has been somewhat of a point of contention for many people, especially when it came to her chest area. Some criticised her for promoting an unhealthy and unattainable body image to young women, whilst others praised the character for being a groundbreaking step for the propagation of female video game protagonists. I'm fully aware, by the way, that I was part of the intended target audience when these games came out, but even back then when playing them, I never thought that her sex appeal was something that overshadowed everything else in those games. Outside of the games, however, that was a different story. It's pretty clear that Eidos were keen to capitalise on her sex appeal, as most of her promotional materials after Tomb Raider 1's release were of her in more suggestive poses. What kept these games from becoming glorified titillation, however, was the dedication and hard work from everyone at Core Design to make these games the best they could be. Yeah, sure, we had moments like the infamous shower scene in Tomb Raider 2, and the final scorecard in Tomb Raider 3 is literally a close-up of Lara's fully rendered ass, but the games always remained focused on puzzle solving, platforming, atmosphere, and combat, with her sex appeal coming afterwards. With that being said, it's pretty clear to me that Eidos had more of a say with Lara Soft redesign in this game, as it's obviously been heavily influenced by her portrayal in their marketing. Some of her previous outfits could certainly be considered sexy, but there was still a level of modesty and practicality to them. 
Her character's sex appeal was certainly still present, but it never became something that you were outright made to pay attention to above everything else. Here in The Last Revelation, it's clear that they wanted to change this by making Lara look as voluptuous as possible. If you look at this side-by-side -side comparison with her old model, you'll notice some quite clear differences. For starters, the width of her shoulders has been reduced to make her bazoongas look even bigger than before, and her trademark tank top is now much lower cut than before to show off more of her cleavage. There's also some extra detailing on her breasts that greatly amplified their shape and size, with some texture work that makes them look like they're glistening. Her shorts have also received an upgrade in detail to a point where you can now clearly make out the outline of each arse cheek underneath them. The overall result is a character whose sex appeal is front and centre, and it's an interesting example of how marketing can directly influence the material it's promoting. While it doesn't negatively affect the game in any way, and certainly isn't something to get upset about, you can't help but not take notice of it here. One unintended side effect is that it can make certain moments unintentionally awkward and hilarious. For example, when Lara is in a tight space, particularly near a wall, the camera isn't able to swing behind her, so instead it does the only thing that it can do and give you a full frontal view of her. The problem is, the camera often decides to zoom right into her thumb bags with such force that it made me feel like her tits were just gonna burst through the TV screen and hit me in the face. Even more hilarious is when I'd go to climb up a pole, only to have the camera give me a view that was so far up her ass I could see what she'd had for dinner last night. Good lord. Is that corn? It's not all TNA, however, as her facial features have also been tweaked to try and make her look more realistic. The results I'd say were fairly successful, though to me she now looks like she's constantly smelling something disgusting and really isn't happy about it. With this game being built on a new engine, it also means the environments have received the biggest boost in visual quality and each level has expanded on their complexity of their design. Caves have a lot more varied geometry to resemble natural formations, structures like temples have a lot more believable proportioning and finer detail to them, and overall each location looks a little more natural and less like they were built out of highly textured Duplo. The lighting in this game is another thing this game uses to great effect in several areas that not only help to craft a brilliant atmosphere, but also give each location a bit more personality. Before you could easily make your way through supposedly dark areas with no problem because the lighting was pretty flat, but now dark areas actually look dark and it gives each area so much more depth than ever before. It was also the first game where I found flares to actually be useful, as some areas were so dark that I couldn't see, so I had to use them to produce my own light source. If there was one thing that I could give this game massive credit for, it would be for the way that it looks. It looks fantastic, and considering that this game only came out a year after the last one, it's a considerable step up from that game. It's just a shame then that the music for this game is kinda... meh? Yeah, the music for this game is pretty forgetful for the most part, especially when compared to the previous games, but that's not to discredit the work of the new composer, Peter Connolly, as what is played here does set the tone for the game really well. In fact, there's one track in particular that sounds like an Egyptian version of the Skidoo, which I really liked, but if you were to ask me to name another track from this game, I'd honestly really struggle to think of one. Thankfully, the sound design is still excellent here, and despite a few sound effects being carryovers from the last game, everything that's new does a really fantastic job of breathing life into this game's world. Jono Elliott also replaces Judith Gibbons as the voice of Lara Croft in this game, and I have to say she does a really good job of it. There is more at stake here than the sum of the pieces, Von Croy. Ever heard of Armageddon? Unpleasant, even by your standards. Her performance in this game is the right mixture of arrogance and class, which is very much in keeping with her character, though this time around she seems to lean more onto the arrogant side, which does lend into the story quite well, as it turns out she's actually kind of the villain in this game. Yes, you heard me correctly, everything that happens in this game I is directly agree. her fault. No ifs, ands, or buts. Well, maybe a few buts. This game is the first that brings Lara's motivation for tomb raiding into question, even going as far as to paint her in a more arrogant and less noble light. It's a topic that Shadow of the Tomb Raider would also touch upon in a similar way, but 19 years later. The story of this game is about Lara venturing into Egypt in search of the Amulet of Horus, an artifact not only of great value, but as it turns out, is the only thing keeping Set locked inside his sarcophagus. Who is Set, I hear you say? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thanks to an exposition dump voiced by a guy who sounds like he's trying way Way too hard to be ominous, we find out that Set is the Egyptian god of chaos, who was a bit too much of a naughty boy and needed a time out to think about what he did, but for all eternity. So Egyptian bird person and part-time cosplayer Horus decides to seal him inside this giant spiky box thing so he can't unleash the many plagues of Egypt onto the world. Now to be fair to Lara, it's not 
all her fault. If she'd had ample warning beforehand that this is what would happen had she taken the amulets, then I'm sure she would have done the smart thing and then just walked away. I mean, it's not like there was anything inscribed on the front of the amulet that described this entire exact thing to her to warn her not to do this in the first place. Oh, wait! I, Semaket, High Priest of Horus, forewarned that he who removes the amulet shall have released said. So you mean to tell me that the world-famous explorer and archaeologist Lara Croft, who has travelled across land and sea, who has seen the Skion of Atlantis resurrect its pyramid, who has seen a dagger turn an Italian mobster into a Chinese dragon, who has seen four shards of a magical meteorite combined together to turn a Scottish person into a mystical spider laser-firing demon thing, would now just carelessly decide to take something this important from this place without knowing what it did or reading about it first? Core design, man. They fucking hated her in this game, didn't they? Whilst she's reading the amulet, her guide who earlier did the smart thing and pegged it straight out of there when he realised where he was, now holds a gun to her head and asks her to give him the amulet. The amulet, woman! She continues to read the inscription, which then causes a lightning bolt to strike the exit to the tomb and knock the dude on his ass. Just as Lara's about to get the upper hand and interrogate him, one of his buddies shows up in a jeep and the next level then begins. A short cutscene then plays showing the man running over to a jeep to make a getaway, but it's not until you've taken care of all of his goons and collected the car keys for the second jeep that he actually bothers to drive away to try and escape. It's a weird paradox to have someone who's so desperate to try and escape from you, yet have such a strong sense of fair play that they're willing to politely wait for you to kill their friends and get a vehicle first. <laughs> what the hell? And now we have our first vehicle section where you have to chase down the traitor and find out who he works for, and... <laughs> oh boy. At least here the vehicle controls are slightly better than before. It's easy enough to get around, make jumps, turn corners, but holy monkey flaps is this section all kinds of broken. For starters, the car you're supposed to be chasing doesn't go fast enough to stop you from overtaking it, meaning that if you know what you're doing, you can easily slip past it. But unless you've played this game before, you will have no clue where you need to go next, so you'll have to slowly tail this thing all the way to the next area so you don't get lost. Secondly, who the hell programmed the grenades that fly out the back of this thing? I've been hit multiple times by these and not once did it look like I even took damage from them. In fact, I think I lost more health to full damage and the goons with Uzis than these things. I mean, just look at this. Look at this! I get directly hit in the fucking head with one of these things and there's no damage done at all. What the hell happened here? Eventually, after a few more driving sections, you get a cutscene of Lara arriving at a small blockade by a boat. The goons spot her and immediately start to attack, but Lara flexes her action hero muscles by driving straight at the dude with the RPG and then shooting him to cause an explosion so she can break the blockade and jump to the boat to safety. Once she's boarded, the camera pans over to a car that pulls up by the shore, and it's revealed that the driver is none other than Werner von Croy, seemingly having survived his earlier predicament and is now a rival of sorts to Lara. The Croft woman has outsmarted you, yeah? And now she escapes. The amulet, Herr von Croy. It talks of the priest, Semerket. Semerket. See, I knew this would come back to bite her on the arse if she didn't try to rescue him, but did she listen? No. It's night time now and we see Lara arrive at the house of a fellow archaeologist who talks like someone who threw Poirot and William Shatner into a blender. The amulet of Horus, an almost legendary artifact. So, you have found and opened the tomb of Set. This doesn't bode well. He then gives an exposition dump to explain where to go next to try and undo her mistake, whilst also out-Frenching Pierre by being shown with a bottle of wine on screen. Point. Prof. Finally realising what she's done, she heads to the Temple of Semaket to find the location of the Armour of Horus, an artefact split into five pieces that when combined summon Horus to defeat Set. And that's pretty much the story for the rest of the game. Lara has unwittingly unleashed the Apocalypse and it's up to her to find the five pieces of Exodia needed to stop it before Von Croy finds them. It's kind of like the narrative equivalent of sending a dirty picture around to the office by accident via email and then desperately going around to each person to try and delete it from their inbox before your boss notices. Like... a glove? It also marks the first time in the series where it broke away from its linear structure and introduced a more non-linear style of level progression. 
Tomb Raider 3 experimented with this to a degree by letting you select what world you wanted to visit next on the map screen, but in Tomb Raider 4 it's more baked into the whole experience. Before you'd have levels that were all self-contained experiences, each puzzle usually had a linear way of solving them with all the items you needed to do so located in that particular level. Now in Tomb Raider 4 you're presented with several levels at once and a hub level of sorts that connects them all together. Each of these sections can be discovered in any order that you wanted to, but there's still only one way for you to be able to progress. There are a few problems with the way they've executed this. One problem is that the game sometimes doesn't have enough signposting to tell you what objects you can interact with, and the other is having solutions to certain puzzles be a little bit too obscure. Being left to work out everything on your own is certainly to be expected by now with Tomb Raider, but this was the first game where I really found this where the hell do I go factor to be a real problem. In the Tomb of Semeket, it's not so much of a problem, but there are a couple of moments that can easily stump first time players as well as returning ones. One example is where you dive into this underwater tunnel and at the bottom you come across what appears to be a dead end with a locked door at the end of it. The first time I played this I was so accustomed to how the previous games had worked that I thought that I had to find a switch or a lever elsewhere to open it. So after several minutes of searching everywhere that I could I found out purely by luck that I could simply open this door by holding down the use button to have Lara pull it open for me. Really? Another example later on is where you climb up to the top of this platform to find a boulder perched on the top of this pillar. Now, logic would dictate that you would need to push it off in some way to make it fall to the ground, but no matter how many times I pressed or held down the action button, Lara just wouldn't grab onto it. Eventually, after much frustration, I became so annoyed with this boulder that I tried to actually shoot it in anger, which ended up turning my anger into disbelief rather quickly when I realized that shooting it was what I needed to do in order to get it to fall. If I had to name one thing that I really don't like about certain puzzle games, it's when they intentionally make the solutions to their puzzles obscure to give the illusion of complexity when really the solution to the puzzle isn't that complex at all. And sadly this game falls into that trap on quite a few occasions here and believe me we'll get to those later. It's not too bad once you get past this though and once you're into the rest of the level you have multiple rooms to explore that have valuable items and interesting puzzles to solve. One puzzle that was particularly clever is when you're in an underwater room and have to use the reflection in this mirror on the wall to find a secret opening in the ceiling. You may have also noticed whilst playing this game that there's also a lack of a scorecard at the end of each level this time. It was a handy feature that helped to cap off each level by showing you the level's name, your completion time and the number of secrets you collected as well as a whole bunch of other cool statistics. With this information now relegated to the pause menu it makes the game feel like one giant level and that in itself presents its own pros and cons. On the one hand, it means the game is less likely to break the player's immersion, but on the other hand, it almost robs the player of the satisfaction of beating a level and knowing how well they did. It also doesn't help that this is by far the longest Tomb Raider game I've had to play so far. Tomb Raider 3 had 19 levels and it kind of felt fairly long, but this game? Oh, this game has 35 levels. 30. Five. I know Tomb Raider's pacing has always been much more slow and deliberate than other games, but here it just feels like it drags on for far, far too long. Partly this is to do with the higher level of backtracking when compared to previous games, but it will also be likely because you'll get burnt out by the Egyptian aesthetic. <sighs> Look, I meant what I said earlier when I said I'm not going to spend this video shitting all over this game, so let's move on from this and talk about the rest of the game. Halfway through the level you see Von Croy's goons pull up to the entrance of the temple and spread out to try and stop you before you find the entrance to the tomb of Semeket. The enemies in this area in general are thankfully pretty straightforward to take care of. The only wildlife you encounter are a few dogs and some scorpions, crocodiles and bats. Though someone needs to let me know what these scorpions are made of because Jesus Christ do they take longer to kill than they really should do. Most of the time you'll be fighting Von Croy's goons who either carry burst firing Uzis or this weird expandable Klingon Batlith type thing. The gun enemies in this game are actually completely fine to deal with, but if these turd wranglers draw their weapons out, they cannot be damaged by bullets. It's just so hilariously stupid when you think about it. Like, imagine that sort of thing working in real life in a real life gunfight. Like, you got some badass that's killed a dozen or so men to get to you. He has a high powered gun. You have a sword. Who do you think will win? The person with the gun? Or the person that's flimsily waving their sword around like a feather duster? The crazy thing is that this actually works. You can't kill them whilst they're doing this lame, limp-wristed animation. 
So what you end up having to do instead is holster your weapons so they put theirs away too, then quickly draw yours out again to land some shots on them. Despite being slightly annoying, these guys are pretty easy to deal with and really don't require much skill at all to be able to kill. They're certainly no slouch at times, but the main thing here is that they're nowhere near as overpowered as Marco Barsley's goons from Tomb Raider 2. <sighs> Sorry, I meant Macho Broccoli. At the end of the level, you open the entrance to the tomb of Semaket with the Amulet of Horus. Stupidly, she leaves the amulet unattended, which allows Von Croy to show up somehow, and take the amulet whilst also sealing her inside. And that makes this the second stupidest thing that Lara has done in this game. Way to go, Lara. You just got outsmarted by an old man with a walking stick. Actually, come to think of it, where the hell is this cutscene even taking place? My first thought would be that it was supposed to take place in the location where I'd just finished the level, but look at this. It doesn't even look remotely the same. Yeah, the statues and the door are there, but this is supposed to be taking place in an open top room. So where have all the walls gone? So now, trapped without the one thing she needed to make sure she didn't lose to Von Croy, being lost to Von Croy, Lara makes her way through the tomb of Semaket like it's hot and faces her greatest enemy yet. DEATH BEETLES! I'm not kidding here either, these beetles are the single deadliest enemy in this game. What, you don't believe me? Well, they can attack in large groups, can overwhelm you quickly, can literally come out from anywhere, and also can drain your health in a matter of seconds. You can't kill these beetles or blow them up with explosives either, so the only way you can fend them off is to find a lit torch and either pick it up or throw it to the ground. Sadly, flares don't have the same effect, so if you don't have any fire to hand, you just have to run and hope for the best. After escaping the army of flesh-eating death beetles and fisting some fiery holes, wink wink, you fall into a room with a giant game board and have to play a game of what looks like Egyptian backgammon or some shit to win the favour of a giant golden fish! Why? How do you play this game? Not a bloody clue, but here's how I understood it. Essentially, you've got to be the first to move all of your pieces to the end of the long part to win. You spin this set of black and white piano keys on the wall to determine how many spaces you can move, then you walk onto a coloured tile to move the corresponding piece. If you land on a square that's already occupied by one of Mr. Giant Head's pieces, then that piece is sent back to the start, and vice versa should he land on yours. If all your pieces reach the end before his, you get to skip a large part of the level, but if you lose, you have to take a longer path with more traps. Ah, but of course I already knew this, and used my trademark high level of skill and cunning to be able to win. Yep, I didn't completely luck out on this at all in any way, and then afterwards discovered that the rules were sitting in my inventory this whole time and would have saved me a lot of trouble. So after dodging more DEATH BEETLES and giving these statues a golden shower, you reach the end of the level and get another cutscene. Lara reads some hieroglyphs that explains how she needs to assemble the armor of Horus. Summon the light of Horus to the light of the millennial constellations, into his temple beneath the ageless pyramid, into his likeness, set in stone, with his mind and his armor, he is once more poised to battle and defeat, said. It's a shame that this takes place in the 90s, as all she'd really need to do is look up some questionable tweets he made years ago and then just have Twitter eat him alive instead. After hearing a distant noise, she makes her way through the next part of the tomb via a map room with a giant laser and ends up in a chamber with several barricaded doors. The whole room starts to then periodically shake, accompanied by a giant thudding noise, and as you approach one of the doors, a giant bull bursts through and immediately starts attacking you. Killing this thing is impossible, by the way, so don't even try, but you likely won't find this out until you've wasted several tons of ammunition on it. So instead you just have to run away from it and find a way to escape. Though uh, running this thing can be kind of interesting, especially if like me you got stuck in a stun animation between his horns and ended up being pushed along the floor like a giant hockey puck. Once you figure out that you can play Matador and have the ball charge into walls, he becomes pretty easy to take care of. Doing this on doors forces them open and allows you access to other areas. On certain pillars in this room here, you can even bait them into hitting them which causes the exit door to open so you can escape. Once you reach the exit, you get a cutscene of Lara emerging as Von Croy escapes on a helicopter. She roughs up the same guide who betrayed her earlier, who then tells her that they're headed off to Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria. <laughs> she knocks him out and then takes his clothes to disguise herself and sneak aboard a nearby train that's headed off to the same place. Your workforce is about to be delayed. <laughs> Fuck, that shit is cold.
old. I take back everything that I said about her ditching the pilot in my Tomb Raider 3 video. That shit there is the most ruthless thing that she's ever done so far. <laughs>